Um, you know, if someone was having a bad day, she was the one to make you laugh. Um, if you, you know, were having a tough table, she would make you laugh. Um, if you needed someone to talk to, she was there. And she's just one of those people that you will remember forever because she touched your heart. This month, Weber says she and Benning's family celebrated her first heavenly birthday. It's the same month that police arrested the father of her child. Police say Taylor had moved to Utah after Benning's death. It was the justice her loved ones have been hoping for. Now, we did confirm that Taylor worked with the Tennessee Titans from 2019 to 20. 23. They said they're not commenting on this as he is not a current employee. For now in Nashville, Kylie Walker, Fox 17 News, your Code Red Station. An update tonight on the search for missing Sumner County teenager Sebastian Rogers. The TBI says agents are now going over security video provided by neighbors and some businesses in that area. They are also looking at data from the 15 year old cell phone and video game system. So far, though, they say it hasn't provided any answers about Rogers whereabouts. He disappeared from the Shackle Island community near Beach High School, where he's a freshman on February 26th. An update tonight, we're learning more about the moments right before a Missouri college student disappeared after leaving a downtown bar. No one has seen Riley Strain since he left Luke Bryan's bar one week ago tonight. The management group for the bar just released brand new information about the 22 year olds timeline. They say that Strain had one alcoholic drink and two waters. Security staff took him out alone while his friends stayed behind to close any open tabs. Video from nearby businesses picked up his movements after leaving that bar. He ended up walking near the Cumberland River. Police have been searching the embankment and the water ever since. New tonight, police in Tullahoma are asking for the public's help to locate a man who has been missing there since the end of last week. Investigators say Dylan Peluso was involved in some sort of an incident at the Country Club Apartments last Thursday. Police say he could be injured, may need medical attention. Peluso's family says he has a 21-month-old daughter who needs him. Continuing coverage on the new Titan Stadium project with all eyes on the projected stadium set to open in 2027. Plans are coming together for the development of their surrounding East Bank neighborhood. The city has a goal of making this new neighborhood affordable for everyone, but it's a plan that could take decades to build with no inked in timeline in sight. A new subsection of Nashville is in the works. Think of the East Bank development like a residential extension of downtown on the other side of the river but with more of a neighborhood feel. And the city is going to great lengths to make sure affordable housing will be included in the plans. Once the new Titan Stadium opens in 2027, the 30 acres surrounding the football field will be built out to include apartments, condos, and homes. There will be two towers, each featuring 300 affordable housing units. The rest of the residential buildings will include up to 10% of affordable units. And the city's made clear East Bank will have a different feel from downtown. We'll have um, limits on the number of hotels. We intend to have limits on concentration of bars um, on the 30 acres on the East Bank. And um, we plan to have short-term rentals um, be prohibited in the 30 acres to make sure that the housing units are for Nashvillians and not just um, basically hotels for whenever big concerts and events happen. In a partnership with the Fallon Company, this $100 million development will retain almost a 100-year lease to keep the affordability component intact. More specifically, developers teamed up with the city to structure affordable housing around what's called an AMI metric area median income based on local current census data. Two-thirds of the affordable housing units will be available at 60% of the area median income, and the other third will be available at 80% of the AMI. Further, there will be a limited subsection of deeply affordable housing available for families that only make 30% of the area median income, giving them an opportunity to buy at their price point. Well, all in all, the total infrastructure costs could be upwards of $227 million, and the projected timeline on the build and move in for residents, still unknown. Happening tonight, the Tennessee Department of Transportation is permanently closing one of the Donaldson Pike exits near the Nashville International Airport. 
It's a little confusing right now. Let me walk you through it. It involves several different steps. First of all, in just about an hour, TDOT is temporarily going to close exit uh, 216 B, which is uh, the one that takes you right up here to Donaldson Pike. We told you about this one, how it's going to change. Now that's only so they can make some adjustments to the lanes and get the traffic lights going in the proper lines, you know, drawn uh, for different directions. Once that's done, uh, which should be around 1 a.m., 216B is going to reopen. Now, TDOT is permanently closing this exit. Still open right now. This is the one where you go underneath Donaldson Pike and make the little curly Q so you can go north on Donaldson. So, 216C is going away, but uh, not until they finish this other work. This is important. Uh, 216A, which uh, takes you from Interstate 40 East right into the Nashville Airport property, is going to remain open during this entire transition. And again, that's the exit that will take you straight off of Interstate 40 coming out of downtown into the airport. Well, new tonight, Tennessee lawmakers in the House passing a bill to require police officers in the state to let Homeland Security know that they've come in contact with an undocumented immigrant. It still has to clear the Senate. Fox 17 News Peyton News explains how this would all work. House representatives went back and forth inside of our Capitol building on the floor for more than 30 minutes. House Republican Representative Rusty Grills sponsors the bill. Rep Grills says in light of what happened to the nursing student in Georgia, a two-year-old killed in Maryland, and 85 pounds of fentanyl seized on I-40 in West Tennessee, it's time. Mm -hmm. Rep Grills says the purpose is for local police officers to share that information with ICE. House Democrats pushing back on this issue. I believe this type of legislation is detrimental. I think it is harmful. I think it is uh, rooted in racism and xenophobia that only creates more problems. And turning that into legislation is, is not something that we should be doing. The politics of division and xenophobic hatred is not about protecting American citizens. It's about creating racist fears of migrants that feed the red meat of racism. Republican lawmakers voicing their experiences in their own cities. The brave men and women of the Jackson Police Department had a shootout with an illegal immigrant. Didn't make the news. Our locals didn't pick it up. Nobody else picked it up. But it happened. There's 151 illegal migrants on the National Terrorism Watch List that have been countered by border protection agents last year. 151 that are on their terrorist watch list. We have a problem in this country and they're coming across the border. We have to do everything we can to protect our citizens. Republican lawmakers say they welcome immigrants but want immigrants to come to America the legal way. The full Senate has to vote on it. We'll keep you updated on how this plays out. Reporting at the Capitol, Peyton Muse, Fox 17 News, your Code Red Station. In the high cost of homelessness, an update tonight on a trash filled camp Fox 17 News has been following and telling you about for several weeks. Tonight, city crews actually closed the camp located on Doverside Drive in North Nashville. It's actually pretty close to a gas station and car wash right across the street from the TriStar Skyline Medical Center, which a lot of you are familiar with. No word on exactly how many people living in that camp that the city is now relocating. A teacher accused of putting her hands on an autistic child now facing some punishment. What the school district is doing tonight. Fulton County DA Fonnie Willis is allowed to stay on the Trump election subversion case in Georgia, but there's a catch. I'm Atrell Nashar with the details coming up. Almost two thirds of fourth graders in the U.S. struggle to read at grade level, and that's why Fox 17 News and our parent company, Sinclair Broadcasting, are partnering with Riff. Reading is fundamental. Low 1.9% financing for five years at Powertrain for Life with your new Nissan here at North Nashville's Nissan of Rivergate in Madison. Tonight in Fox 17 News investigates new developments on a Clarksville teacher accused of manhandling a four year old boy who has autism. Tonight, Clarksville Montgomery County Schools tell Fox 17 that an investigation by the Tennessee Department of Children's Services concluded the child was abused. Fox 17 News Amanda Chen broke this story last month and is here to bring us up to speed. I am told that it is up to the district to determine what repercussions a teacher would receive after this type of investigation. While this teacher, Stacey Williams, will now be included on an abuse registry with DCS, the district tells me she has been placed at a different work site until further notice. This comes after Ja'Kyra Crockett says Williams pulled her son Landon's hair 
grabbed his wrist and put her hands on his mouth at Minglewood Elementary School. Landon has autism and is non-speaking. In a Fox 17 News public records request, we were able to verify those details through a letter from the director of schools who saw the video. Williams denies putting her hands on Landon. While the district attorney has refused to file criminal charges, the mother tells me DCS reopened their case a few weeks ago. I need my son to know that as parents, we did everything we could. Because let me tell you, there is no amount of money in this world that will change what we feel. The mother tells me while she's happy with the DCS investigation and how far the case has come, she is still pushing for the district attorney to file criminal charges against Williams. So far, we have not gotten a response from the district attorney. Reporting in the studio, I'm Amanda Chin, Fox 17 News, your Code Red Station. New tonight, Georgia District Attorney Fonnie Willis will remain on the case against former President Trump, even with allegations of a conflict of interest. As Fox 17 News' Antra El Nishar explains, there's a catch. District Attorney Fonnie Willis getting a partial win. She will remain on the election subversion case against former President Trump and more than a dozen co-defendants because her lead prosecutor, and as we now know, former boyfriend Nathan Wade, is stepping down. It's a surprising decision. I think it may be a wise decision. Probably each side will be a little frustrated. The judge did split the baby. Trump and his fellow defendants argued Willis and Wade have a conflict of interest due to their romantic relationship Wade and Willis said ended last year and would benefit financially from their work on the case. A claim Willis adamantly denied in court. I think you lied right here. No, 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 no. This is the truth, Judge. And this it, is, it, it is a lie. Judge McAfee says the defense did not provide sufficient evidence that Willis acquired a personal stake in the prosecution or that her financial arrangements had any impact on the case, but says the appearance of impropriety requires either Willis or Wade to step down. The choice is obvious. If it were Willis, the case would essentially come to a halt. Judge McAfee says Willis had a tremendous lapse in judgment and during the evidentiary hearings displayed an unprofessional manner. It certainly doesn't look good for her and for her office the way this whole thing has been handled. Expected to file an appeal, Trump's attorney Steve Sato says we will use all legal options available as we continue to fight to end this case, which should never have been brought in the first place. Now that Wade will be removed from the case, do Trump and his fellow defendants have any argument that that conflict still exists? I think this will decision will to stand. I think the judge kind of within his discretion made a wise decision. Fonnie Willis had earlier talked about an August 2024 trial date. I think that's highly unlikely. I think the appeal of this decision could potentially slow it down. It's a case that now has 35 charges instead of 41. Judge McAfee dismissing six of them earlier this week, three of which were against Trump, who still faces 10 charges in Georgia. In Washington, I'm Atrel Nishar reporting. The weekend finally upon us, and now that the storms have passed, we can look ahead to uh, some cooler weather that will eventually work its way into the area. That'll be our trend here. Uh, starting off not too bad. In fact, for Saturday, temperatures will top off in the upper 60s with a partly cloudy sky. Overall, pretty nice afternoon. Then we get into Sunday. We'll see mostly cloudy skies for the morning hours. A little bit more sunshine as we head towards the afternoon. But temperatures will be a little cooler as we top off in the upper 50s to low 60s for the day. And still cooler as we head into Monday of next week with a big cold front coming through. That is actually going to drop our temperatures here for Monday and Tuesday into that freeze category. So right around 31 on Monday, early Tuesday morning, the first day of spring. Very frosty morning it looks like for us. And then from there we'll start to warm up. So we do have a couple cold mornings ahead. And for perspective, it's about average for this time of year. Our average last freeze still a couple weeks away. So uh, it's nothing that's too soon or too late for us. We're still right in that sweet spot. Now the latest freeze that uh, Nashville has ever seen that happened April 25th.
so still have a ways to go for that. Let's check out your forecast for the weekend here. The front that brought us all those showers and thunderstorms that has passed to our south and east. And as we head through the overnight into early Saturday morning, you can see that uh, we are nice and dry for tomorrow. Sunshine should be out. It'll be a partly cloudy to mainly clear sky. Here we go into Sunday. Now this is interesting to see showers and thunderstorms early Sunday morning, possibly even some strong thunderstorms uh, in Alabama. This cold front coming in that'll bring us the colder air you have to thank for keeping the active weather to our south. So this is going to actually help push these showers and storms away from Tennessee as we head through Sunday morning. I can't rule out a stray shower or two, uh, mainly non severe along the Tennessee and Alabama border. The better threat for severe weather looks to be to our south. Uh, in Alabama. Notice as we head towards Sunday evening, the front continues to push to the south and east and it will uh, take the cloud cover with it as we head into the early next week, but it is going to bring in that cool weather. We'll look for a clear sky or at least a mainly clear sky uh, or a mainly cloudy sky, I should say, going into the evening hours. Temperatures hold in the mid 40s on our way to the upper 60s for tomorrow. Partly cloudy sky and looking pretty nice to start the weekend. Coming up, we'll talk more about St. Patrick's Day. We've got the St. Patrick's Day parade forecast coming up. Okay, speaking of which, uh, that's a subject of our poll tonight. We want to know if you are planning to celebrate St. Patrick's Day, which is Sunday, 214 votes, 67.8% say nope, and 32% say yes, we will. Polls live right now. Scan the QR code to take you to our X poll, and we'll update the results for you later in the broadcast. A new weapon in the battle against breast cancer. The life-saving tool now available. Download the CMA Connect app for stage lineups and schedules. Secure your spot now with a four-night pass or single-night tickets at CMAFest.com. In your health news tonight, a new weapon in the battle against breast cancer. It's a risk assessment tool that may help you uncover breast cancer missed by a normal mammogram. Fox 17 News' Amanda Chin explains. She's known for her role on the silver screen, but this week, actress Olivia Munn took to social media, sharing that she's undergone a double mastectomy after discovering she had breast cancer. The diagnosis made shortly after what she called a normal mammogram. Mammograms aren't perfect. They're still the best screening tool we have for the broad population. Dr. Daniel Stover with the Ohio State University Comprehensive Cancer Center says in addition to mammograms, knowing your family health history and genetic risk factors is critical. Munn credits the discovery of her cancer to the use of a risk assessment tool done by her OBGYN. I think one of the things that certainly surprises some of our patients who are diagnosed with breast cancer or is that when they go through those score calculations, they may have a higher risk than they anticipated. The National Cancer Institute says a breast cancer risk assessment tool uses a statistical model to estimate a woman's risk of developing breast cancer. Typically, it involves several questions about the person's medical history, reproductive history, and family history. It's usually done by a doctor but can also be completed online by a patient. Stover says that while a risk score doesn't diagnose the cancer, it empowers the patient and doctor with knowledge that can allow for further screening, like an ultrasound or MRI. As it sounds like in this case was really valuable in that a breast cancer was detected uh, when the screening was initiated based on uh, one of those risk scores. Amanda Chin, Fox 17 News, your Code Red Station. In entertainment news, the world's longest running radio show celebrating 50 years at the Grand Ole Opry House out in Donaldson this weekend. First show over the Opry's current home, March 16, 1974. Back then, Opry members Bill Anderson, Jeannie Seeley, and Connie Smith, who were on that very first show at the Opry House, will be honored at the anniversary show tomorrow night. Other headliners for that 50th anniversary program, Clint Black, Crystal Gale, and Mark Wills. New tonight, the Nashville Sounds make some changes to improve the fan experience at First Horizon Park. The team installed LED lights to replace the old halogen bulbs to improve visibility for players and fans. It also expanded the netting from the end of the dugouts to well beyond the first and third base lines in the name of safety. Beyond that, the club also added padding on the walls between the bullpen and the dugouts and replaced padding on the outfield walls. The Sounds home opener this season is April 2nd. 
Up next, getting a break. The change benefiting anyone buying or selling a home. In Metro APR for a thousand bonus cash. Visit your local Hyundai dealer today. This Fox 17 newscast is sponsored by BF Myers Furniture. It's your money and our partners at OpenTheBooks.com have discovered hundreds of Metro employees who appear to be making more money on paid leave not working than when they were actually on the job. Open the Books looked at Metro records dating back to 2020. They found city employees, including police officers, firefighters, and others, paid nearly $10 million for not working. More than 50 people, they say, earn more than $10,000 each in paid leave, and that's everything from medical problems, being away from work while an employee investigated say for wrongdoing we found people on this list that are making double their normal salary when they get placed on paid leave there's a dental hygienist here usually makes forty five thousand dollars she made forty three thousand when they put her on leave for six months we found an assistant public defender who's usually making about sixty thousand a year he took home about thirty thousand just in the first three months of last year Metro spends more than $2 million every year on paid leave. This year, Open the Book says that figure is already at $1.6 million, and we've got a lot of year left. Meantime, in your consumer news, a change could save you thousands of dollars when you buy or sell a home. The National Association of Realtors will end the 6% commission collected. The change is part of a settlement with home sellers who had sued them for conspiring to keep agent commissions artificially inflated. The group also agreed to new rules to keep sellers from being forced to pay certain fees to their broker and to the buyer's broker. Experts say the settlement could create a more competitive housing market. Looking ahead to Sunday morning in Nashville in focus this week, uh, topics for our panel will include new details on the mayor's transit improvement plan that will appear on the ballot in November. To me, the best part is the synchronized or the smart lights. I really like that yes. feature. I do like the rapid transit from those others. I think one of the big problems that we have is getting people from the outlying counties. Other topics this week, the lack of decorum downtown and uh, the state legislature, as well as efforts to vacate the entire 10-member board of trustees at Tennessee State University. That's Sunday morning at 630 on Nashville in Focus. Clouds have been tough to get rid of tonight, and nights like these are actually kind of neat, just in the way of in the downtown area. With all the lights around, you can actually see a little bit of reflection of all of the city lights in the cloud cover. So if you look at the clouds, it almost looks a little brighter uh, than what it normally might be. And if uh, you step outside or if you've been outside and kind of notice that if you're within the city limits, it's because of all of the city lights reflecting light off of this low cloud deck. Uh, that's been a uh, really stubborn to let go and we will start to see a little bit more in the way of sunshine as we get into tomorrow. The front is well south of us along with the rain and that's good. It's looking like it's going to be a fairly nice weekend. 53 our temperature at the moment here in Nashville. We're down to about 50 in Hopkinsville and still hanging on to the upper 50s out toward the plateau. Overnight lows here drop back into those mid to lower 40s. May see a few upper 30s up in southern Kentucky. We'll talk more about the St. Patrick's Day parade forecast. That's for tomorrow. That's coming up in your Fox 17 code red forecast. Megan. Thank you, Katie. Well, Nashville's snowiest day in history occurred on St. Patrick's Day. Fox 17 code red meteorologist Brett Luna breaking down those numbers. Well, it's almost St. Patrick's Day, so I thought we'd talk a little bit about one of the most extreme weather events that we've seen right here in Nashville on St. Patrick's Day. We have to go all the way back to 1892 for this one, a snowfall event that still holds the record to this day for the snowiest day in Nashville's history. Here in Nashville, we picked up 17 inches of snow on the 17th of March alone. Murfreesboro came in a close second with 15 inches of snow, and everybody within that orange swath pretty much getting double-digit inches of snow. This was just a huge snowfall event, especially for the month of March right here in Middle Tennessee. So here's what happened. Leading up to this event, Nashville had only gotten three tenths of an inch of snow that winter so far, and it was looking like winter was pretty much over with. On March 13th, a strong cold front moves in, and then on March 15th, Nashville gets 4.2 inches of snow, but most of this melts though as we warm up, and now winter is finally looking like it is actually coming to an end, but then on March 17th, Nashville gets hit with 17 inches of snow in total. 
Nashville got 21.8 inches of snow that winter. 21.5 inches of that was in the month of March alone, just in a few days time. March of 1892 still holds the record as the snowiest month in Nashville's history. Also, I thought this was pretty cool too. This was from the National Weather Service. This is from an article out of the Associated Press. So this is from a wire from the Associated Press, and this conversation took place. The Memphis operator says that the snow here is four feet deep, and then an operator up in Cincinnati said, you mean four inches, don't you? And then the Memphis operator responds, and he says, no, it's up to a man's knee. Just ahead, a big orange disappointment today. We'll tell you what went wrong for the top-seeded Vols at the SEC Basketball Tournament downtown at Bridgestone Arena. Some not, but all with big savings. Town and Country Ford in Madison. This Fox 17 newscast is sponsored by Eurostone. Well, one of the Titans' biggest needs this offseason is receiver, and today they signed a candidate for wide receiver one, former Jag star Calvin Ridley. Uh, he's a good one. He was a first-round pick for Atlanta back in the 2018 draft, but he didn't jumpstart his career until recently. Ridley's best season came in 2020 when he finished with over 1,000 yards receiving, nine touchdowns. That was with the Falcons. He was suspended, some may remember, for the 2020 season, violating the NFL's gambling policy. Apparently placed a bet on the team's property. Didn't bet on the team. That wasn't it. Well, Ridley, uh, Ridley I should say, had another 1,000-yard season with the Jags this past year. And uh, Ridley says the Titans made him a first-class offer. Reportedly four years, $92 million. But he says he also wants a fresh start. I'm a good player. I'm, I'm, the, I'm the type of player, you know, who, who, who deserves this contract. I'm going to say that. I'm the type of player who... You know, you want in the building who, who you, someone who's gonna work for the for your for your organization. Y'all got a, a player who gonna come and work for that for whatever y'all gave me, and, and y'all got a player. You can hear more of Calvin Ridley's introductory news conference Sunday night, 10 o'clock, right here on Fox 17 Sports Overtime. Well, former Titans head coach Mike Vrabel has found a new team. The Cleveland Browns reportedly hiring Vrabel as a coaching and personnel consultant. Vrabel will be returning to his home state where he grew up and played college ball at Ohio State. This is Vrabel's first job since he was fired by the Titans in January after six seasons in charge. Tennessee fans in Nashville to cheer on the Vols in the SEC basketball tournament were greeted with shock and disappointment. Fox 17 Sports Director Jill Jelnick with more on the Vols early exit today and what this means for the NCAA tournament. The fifth ranked Tennessee Vols coming into Nashville this week, hoping to make a run and also lock up that coveted number one seed in the upcoming NCAA tournament. However, the Vols fell well short of expectations Friday, got knocked out of their opening game and lost to a Mississippi State Bulldog team that just had more bite at Bridgestone Arena. Tennessee head coach Rick Barnes saying afterwards his team didn't stick to their game plan. He said they came out sloppy defensively and the Bulldogs walked all over them in the paint, outscoring the Vols 42 to 14. As a result, that bled into their offensive performance where Barnes said they didn't take care of the little things. They didn't work to get open. They didn't set screens. And as a result, they weren't taking the shots they wanted to. Tennessee shot just 20% from the field in that first half, was never able to recover after the break as the Vols would ultimately fall 73-56. to 56. Well, We got down and um, um, it's almost like, a, you know, it just it snowballed on us. And, uh, but we didn't uh, do a very good job of staying to our game plan. And I think they, Coach Jansen probably tell you they did a great job of executing their game plan. And uh, again, congratulations to them. They, they dominated the game any and every way they wanted to. I feel like, I feel like defenses would, I mean, that's, that's how you're going to lose games. Offensively, you don't know if you're going to hit shots or not, but you can control defense. You can always control defense. And like you know like they like they always done if whether they lose or win they're going to stick with what they do they didn't change whether it was the first time we played them or now they did what they always do the film don't lie and we just got to take it to heart and know that if we go out there and do that again it's going to be the end of the season so we got to know what's that what's that cost Coming into this week, Tennessee Vols had a chance at getting that number one seed in the upcoming NCAA tournament. However, now with this early exit in the SEC tournament, more than likely the Vols missed out on their first ever number one seed in program history. 
more than likely Vols will get the number two seed. That won't be made official until the NCAA select. Reporting from Bridgestone Arena, Jill Jelnick, Fox 17 Sports, your Code Red Station. Coming up, talking more about the weekend, which includes your St. Patrick's Day parade forecast. Also, we had a clear and present danger. Bridge LX for 279 a month. This Fox 17 This Morning newscast is sponsored by Electronic Express. We make it happen. Continuing coverage now on the debate over whether the popular TikTok app should be banned in the U.S. The House of Representatives a couple days ago overwhelmingly passed a, a bill that would mandate ByteDance, a Chinese company that owns the app, to sell that company within six months or be banned in our country. The fear is the Chinese Communist Party will use the app to spy on us or collect data on American users or use that app to impact our elections. Joining us now with some insights on the danger of this app, retired FBI Special Agent Scott Augenbaum. And uh, Scott, a lot of regular Americans are pushing back on this because they like the app, but I know your background, which includes cybercrime. Give us uh, your take on how real the danger is. Yeah, before we go into should we ban it or should we not, let's just go back on the facts. I'm a retired FBI agent. I started with the FBI in 1988. The Chinese government was the number one threat of espionage behind the Russian government. I get involved in cybercrime in the early 2000s. Chinese were behind a majority of the theft of intellectual property, trade secrets, and theft of data. Even here in Nashville, I've seen it for probably 10, 11 years. And now the Chinese government is behind this app. I hate to say it until they prove anything differently. That's my concern. But there's 170 million Americans who are using it. That's where the debate is starting to come up. Let me peel the onion one more layer. You did uh, time in the FBI service in Nashville, and China was a threat even to people here. It wasn't some big greater American thing. We're talking threats to data in Middle Tennessee. I've seen it with some of the largest organizations in Nashville were being targeted by the Chinese government for theft of intellectual property, academic information, manufacturing, because part of China's strategic plan is to be the world's leader in everything. They want to take over the world. That's public record on the Chinese part, and it's to influence people. And what does TikTok do? Influences people. Boy, does that. Let me get your take on this. The, the Chinese uh, government has never invaded another country to date. However, they've been very provocative in terms of uh, Taiwan, the United States support of that. Can you see China potentially going to a real war with the United States? Uh, they've been going through proxy war. I believe, you know, we've been at war with the Chinese probably since the early 2000s with the theft of things. Today, I'm not as concerned about that, but what we have going on over in Taiwan and with other parts of the world, I've never been at a point like this before where there's so many different global conflicts and we have to manage it on so many different ends. And now we're all talking about TikTok, a social media app on top of this. It's uh, quite the topic, and I don't think we've heard the end of it. Retired FBI Special Agent Scott Augenbaum, who makes his home here in Middle Tennessee. Scott, always great to talk with you. Thank you. Well, NASCAR heading to Bristol Motor Speedway this weekend. Heather Williams has a preview of Sunday's Cup Series race. I'm Heather Williams on the backstretch, and here's a look at some of the storylines you need to keep an eye on as NASCAR heads to the Bristol Motor Speedway this weekend. <laughs> Redemption for Christopher Bell at Phoenix. Is that a confidence boost since Phoenix will be where NASCAR crowns its champion this fall? Everybody knows that the championship races at Phoenix. This is the only time they've got really to work on things for the championship race. And for him to be able to say, hey, we won the race here uh, last week and uh, we, can, we can go off all that for Phoenix and we're gonna be maybe a leg up. Bristol? In the rain? Probably not, but Harrison Burton says the possibility of that happening is brave. We'll, we'll see how NASCAR kind of elects to use that um, option. I, I really haven't heard a whole lot about how the test went, to be honest. So uh, hopefully we're just racing in the dry and, uh, and we don't have to worry about all that mess. 
You can see my full conversation with our expert Chris Carrier and driver Harrison Burton on the Backstretch podcast, which you can find on Apple Podcasts and YouTube. On the Backstretch, I'm Heather Williams. And you can catch that race right here on Fox 17 Sunday at 2 o'clock. It's been a busy night downtown on Broadway with the SEC tournament in town. I've been uh, watching the camera every now and then, and it's been a steady stream of uh, folks out and about on Broadway. Uh, live look right now, still a lot of people out and about enjoying the evening. Temperatures really aren't too bad. Uh, sitting, uh, We've been sitting mainly in the uh, 60s for today. We'll drop back into the mid 40s for the overnight. We take a look here at what we can expect as we head into tomorrow. St. Patrick's Day Parade is set for tomorrow in East Nashville at 10 o'clock in the morning. And we check out your forecast here starting at 9. Temperature right around 49. We're up to those mid to upper 50s as we head towards uh, the late morning hours and should top off in the mid to upper 60s for the day. The good news is we've got that golden sunshine around for tomorrow. Uh, hopefully we will burn off this cloud cover by then. We have a mostly cloudy sky at the moment, but expecting more of that sunshine as we head towards uh, the afternoon hours tomorrow. Overall for Nashville to Clarksville and Murfreesboro, we check out temperatures here in green and your wind speeds here are the uh, bottom number. As we head through the afternoon, Topping off about 2, 3 o'clock in the afternoon hours in those mid to upper 60s. 66 in Nashville, Clarksville, and Murfreesboro, all mid 60s expected there. We'll keep skies partly cloudy throughout the afternoon and into the evening hours, uh, starting to drop back from those low 60s, eventually into the 50s, and then uh, possibly looking at a few 40s for early Sunday morning. This is Sunday, 1 o'clock, and then AM and then into the early morning hours here, dropping back into those upper 40s here. Wind speed's not looking too bad either. About 5 to 10 miles per hour through the morning on Sunday. Four days to go for the official beginning of spring. And I mentioned earlier that it's going to be pretty frosty the first day of spring. Temperatures right around 30 in the after in the morning. Afternoon, we're looking at highs in the mid to upper 50s. Then we look ahead here to the final few weeks here of uh, March, the 23rd through the 29th. The trend right now showing a lot of below average temperatures possible for mainly the western half of the U.S. and some of that creeping into the central plains as well. We're in what we call that equal chance category, which means we don't really see a strong signal either way. Uh, and then maybe some above average conditions out uh, toward the eastern seaboard. All of us, though, looking at the, uh, the, the uh, possibility of above average precipitation as we head through the uh, last couple of weeks. And, you know, I was looking at the long range uh, forecast a little while ago and unfortunately it does look a little active. So that is something we will be keeping our eye on. Until then, we've got a nice pattern here in play. Nice cool dip as far as temperatures go. First day of spring on Tuesday, we're climbing from those 50s, in fact, upper 40s Monday, back to the mid 60s by the end of the week with mainly dry conditions. Truth in pricing, how the feds are putting the screws to satellite and cable. This Fox 17 newscast is sponsored by Eurostone. In your consumer news tonight, if you're aggravated by all the extra fees on your cable TV bill, uh-huh. Well, things are about to change. Federal Communications Commission is now requiring those cable and satellite TV providers to show all the costs right up front. The new pricing rules will target any miscellaneous fees, like those regional sports programming charges you've probably seen, which can add up to more than 100 bucks a year. The FCC says cable and satellite providers mislead customers like you and me by failing to include these costs in promotional materials and offers when they're signing us up for service. Get your green on and get a free donut at Krispy Kreme this weekend. The donut chain giving away special green glazed original donuts to anyone wearing green. The offer is good on both Saturday and Sunday for a St. Patrick's Day freebie. I love those. All right, coming up next here on Fox 17 News at 9, we'll see just how many of you plan to celebrate St. Patrick's Day this weekend. You game. Believe on. Wigovi.
Update tonight on tonight's uh, Fox 17 viewer poll uh, that is looking forward to Sunday, St. Patrick's Day. The question is uh, an easy one. Are you celebrating St. Patrick's Day this weekend? Katie mentioned the parade on Saturday in East Nashville. 245 people weighing in. 68.6% .6 say no, we are not. 31.4% say they are. The poll's still live right now if you'd like to cast your vote. Scan the QR code there on the right and we'll run these numbers for you again tonight on Fox 17 News at 10. A new study looks at your sit time and a potential link to your heart health and how long you live. I'm Liz Bonus. What a difference it could make if we stand up. We explain just ahead. This is Fox 17 News at 10, your code red station. It has definitely weight lifted off a lot of us knowing that Jade's going to get the justice that she deserves. Tonight in Operation Crime and Justice, a former Tennessee Titan scout is charged with killing his 25 year old girlfriend and their unborn child. Well, Metro Police say he poisoned them. Investigators say 27 year old Blaze Taylor called 911 last February, claiming his girlfriend Jade Benning was having an allergic reaction. She and their unborn child died days later at Vanderbilt. Now, Benning passed away on her 25th birthday. She worked as a chef at the Ernst Bar and Hideaway, and friends say she hoped to have her own restaurant one day. Jade was kind of the glue that held us all together. Um, you know, if someone was having a bad day, she was the one to make you laugh. Um, if you, you know, were having a tough table, she would make you laugh. Um, if you needed someone to talk to, she was there. And she's just one of those people that you will remember forever because she touched your heart. Police say Taylor moved to Utah after Benning's death before he was arrested. He's been charged with two counts of first degree murder. Continuing coverage tonight as Luke Bryan's bar releases details of Riley Strain's time inside their establishment. Shortly after the college student left, he disappeared. The statement read in part during Riley's visit to Luke's 32 Bridge, our records show he purchased and was served one alcoholic drink and two waters. At 9.35 p.m., our security team made a decision based on our conduct standards to escort him from the venue through our Broadway exit at the front of our building. He was followed down the stairs with one member of his party. The individual with Riley did not exit and returned upstairs. This week, Fox 17 was able to walk Riley Strain's apparent path after he left Luke Bryan's bar. We ended the walk at the last known location where his cell phone was connected to a cell tower near the Cumberland River downtown. To see the entire time lapse of Strain's path and our complete coverage of this story, go to our website, fox17.com, and search Riley Strain. Tonight in Fox 17 News investigates new developments in a Fox 17 News probe into a school teacher accused of manhandling a four year old Clarksville boy at school. The Clarksville Montgomery County School District tells us a State Department of Children's Services investigation concluded the child, the young boy who has autism, was abused. The mom, Jacaria Crockett, says Stacy Adams, the teacher, pulled her son Landon's hair, grabbed his wrist, and put her hand over his mouth at Minglewood Elementary School. Fox 17 News was able to verify those details by using an open records law in Tennessee to get access to a letter from the director of schools who saw video of the incident. Williams, the teacher who denies putting hands on the boy, is still employed by the school district but has been moved to another assignment. The district attorney initially refused to file charges, but the child's mother says DCS reopened its case a few weeks ago. I need my son to know that as parents we did everything we could because let me tell you there is no amount of money in this world that will change what we feel. Jacari Crockett, the mother, says she is pleased with the DCS's finding. She is still tonight pushing for criminal charges. Hey, check this out. Tennessee is one of 11 states that AAA is helping out this St. Patrick's Day, offering their tow to go program. The company will give people who've been drinking a ride home. And according to AAA, over 25 years, the program has helped keep more than 30,000 impaired drivers off of local roadways. 
As we head into the evening hours tonight, uh, temperatures will drop back into those mid 40s, hanging on to some of that cloud coverage still, uh, but folks still on about enjoying downtown this evening. Current temperature uh, in Nashville sitting in the low 50s. Overcast skies out there for tonight and will slowly uh, give way to a partly cloudy sky as we head into tomorrow. But the good news is the rain has come and gone. The front is well south of us now. And uh, that again will continue to help us clear as we head more towards tomorrow afternoon. Lows tonight drop down to about 46 here in town. Lebanon, Murfreesboro, mid 40s, 40s out toward the plateau. We may squeak out a few upper 30s for early tomorrow. Morning. But we'll quickly quickly climb, expecting highs in the mid to upper 60s uh, for the afternoon hours here in Nashville. We check out uh, the forecast, uh, the early morning forecast here, the coffee cast temperature around 44 uh, for the morning hours, and that'll climb quickly, as I mentioned, right around 49 by 9. We'll be looking at that north wind in play, so that's helping to usher in still some comfortable dry air that we'll have around for the weekend, and the sunshine too, expecting partly cloudy skies. What we're expecting through the weekend, including your St. Patrick's Day forecast. That coming up. Scott. Katie, thank you. This week on Full Measure, a new. Runoffs. Our current election system and. What's behind the big money push by these big money foundations and political politically toned billionaires, for example, what's their interest in it? Uh, most of fair votes funding comes from individual donations, but we do get a number of larger donations from foundations. And I think these foundations uh, tend to invest in a number of uh, good elections or, or uh, pro-democracy type reforms, and they're looking for more stability in our politics, I think, and I think some upgrades to our elections help us inject more stability into our political system and make it easier to make progress on every other issue. Both sides of this debate Sunday morning at 7.30 on Full Measure with Cheryl Atkinson right here on Fox 17. Red Station alerts, empowers, protects. This Fox 17 newscast is sponsored by Tennessee Home Buyers. Happening right now, a live look at one of our T-Dot Smartway traffic cameras. Exit 216B near the airport on I-40 East out in Donaldson. This exit's going to be closed for about five hours while T-Dot crews fix the markings on that exit and the traffic light right at the end of the ramp at Donaldson Pike. Then around 1 o'clock this morning, T-Dot's going to open exit uh, 216B, permanently close 216C, which will take you uh, in a little corkscrew there to northbound Donaldson Pike. Exit 216A. A, uh, by the way, which is over on the far left hand side of your screen. That one takes you directly into the airport. It will remain open during the entire transition, so know that. Continuing coverage tonight as the U.S. Senate decides whether to ban TikTok. There are some concerns about what the bill would do and warnings about potentially larger issues. Fox 17 News' Janae Bowen has more on the entire controversy, and this is another one of those stories where we want your vote. Just scan the QR code that will appear on your screen to take you to our ballot. A TikTok ban bill seemed like it was on the fast track to becoming law, but it slowed down in the Senate as a wide variety of concerns are surfacing. Not only 5 million small businesses rely on it, but 170 million people rely on this app for more than just their livelihood. They rely on this app for their mental health. The concerns go beyond those of the users and creators. If the uh, company is banned or you say it can't have the current ownership and the company goes away, you're basically taking their First Amendment rights away with them also. The hesitancy is bipartisan, with Democratic Senators Catherine Cortez Masto and Jackie Rosen still reviewing the proposal. And businessman Elon Musk posted on X, the censorship bill is far too broad. It will be abused in the future. There are also various questions, including whether it has legal standing on an international scale. 
if TikTok can sue and how the legislation would impact other foreign adversary controlled applications. If this bill passes, nothing is actually going to happen for years because it has some really glaring weaknesses that TikTok's lawyers are going to be able to exploit. TikTok CEO Shu Chu was on Capitol Hill this week, pleading with senators to not pass the bill. There's a lot of misinformation out there, and I intend to clarify it. You know, there's a lot of noise, but I haven't heard you know, exactly what we've done this week. Now keep in mind, even if ByteDance wanted to sell TikTok to an American buyer, China could use export controls to potentially block the sale of TikTok's algorithm. In Washington, I'm Janae Bowens. Well, during that story, we had a QR code with a poll linked up to this question asking, should Congress ban TikTok? And here are the results. 345 people weighing in, 56.2% say no, 43.8% say yes. Still to come tonight on Fox 17 News at 10, locking down wide receiver number one, why Calvin Ridley chose the Titans over other NFL teams. And big orange disappointment. What went wrong for the top seeded bowls today at Bridgestone Arena? Select 2023 Jeep brand vehicles. Hurry, don't miss this great offer. This Fox 17 newscast is sponsored by Xander Insurance. One of the Titans' biggest needs during the offseason, wide receiver. And today, the team signed former Jaguar star wideout Calvin Ridley. Well, the Falcons took Ridley in the first round in the 2018 NFL Draft. After hitting a bump in the road, Ridley jump-started his career last season. That's right. Now, his best season so far, back in 2020, he had over 1,000 yards, receiving nine touchdowns. That was with the Falcons. He got suspended for the entire 2022 season for violating the league's gambling policy. Followed that up with another 1,000-yard season with the Jags last year. Well, Ridley said in a press conference that a big reason he came to Nashville was for the money. Reportedly a four-year deal worth, oh, wow, a lot of zeros on this one, $92 million. But he also said he wants a fresh start. I'm a good player. <laughs> I'm, I'm, the, I'm the type of player, you know, who, who, who deserves this contract. I'm going to say that. I'm the type of player who, you know, you in the building, who, who, someone who's going to work for, the, for, your, for your organization. Y'all got a, a player who's going to come and work for that, for whatever y'all gave me, and, and y'all got a player. Congratulations. I say you're worth whatever you can get somebody to pay you. Yeah. You can hear more of Ridley's introductory news conference Sunday night, 10 o'clock, right here on Fox 17 Sports Overtime. Love his confidence, too. It's sitting mm. right. Well, former Titans head coach Mike Vrabel finding a new team himself. The Cleveland Browns reportedly hiring Vrabel as a coaching and personnel consultant. Vrabel will be returning to his home state where he grew up and played college ball at Ohio State. This is Vrabel's first job since he was fired by the Titans in January after six seasons in charge. A lot of Tennessee Titans fans were in Nashville today to cheer the Vols on at the SEC basketball tournament. Unfortunately, not much to cheer about. The Vols get blown out by Mississippi State. Oh, man. Fox 17 Sports Director Jill Jelnick has more on the game and what this now means for the postseason. The fifth ranked Tennessee Vols coming into Nashville this week, hoping to make a run and also lock up that coveted number one seed in the upcoming NCAA tournament. However, the Vols fell well short of expectations Friday, got knocked out of their opening game and lost to a Mississippi State Bulldog team that just had more bite at Bridgestone Arena. Tennessee head coach Rick Barnes saying afterwards his team didn't stick to their game plan. He said they came out sloppy defensively and the Bulldogs walked all over them in the paint, outscoring the Vols 42 to 14. As a result, that bled into their offensive performance where Barnes said they didn't take care of the little things. They didn't work to get open. They didn't set screens. And as a result, they weren't taking the shots they wanted to. Tennessee shot just 20% from the field in that first half, was never able to recover after the break as the Vols would ultimately fall 73-56. to 56. We got down and um, um, it's almost like, a, you know, it just it snowballed on us. And, uh, but we didn't uh, do a very good job of staying to our game plan. And I think they, Coach Chance would probably say they did a great job of executing their game plan. And uh, again, congratulations to them. They, they dominated the game any and every way they wanted to. I feel like, I feel like defenses 
with, I mean, that's that's how you're going to lose games. Offensively, you don't know if you're going to hit shots or not, but you can control defense. You can always control defense. And like, you know, like they like they always done, if, whether they lose or win, they're going to stick with what they do. They didn't change whether it was the first time we played them or now. They did what they always do. We filmed online, and we just got to take it to heart and know that if we go out there and do that again, it's going to be the end of the season, so we got to know what's at, what's at cost. Coming into this week, Tennessee Vols had a chance at getting that number one seed in the upcoming NCAA tournament. However, now with this early exit in the SEC tournament, more than likely the Vols missed out on their first ever number one seed in program history. More than likely, Vols will get the number two seed. That won't be made official until the NCAA selection show. Reporting from Bridgestone Arena, Jill Jelnick, Fox 17 Sports, your Code Red Station. Rain has cleared out and we're left with cooler numbers as we head into the weekend here. That is what's trending over the next couple of days. We'll see temperatures in the upper 60s for tomorrow and uh, from there starting to cool down for Sunday and then more so into Monday as we struggle to reach 50. So it'll be downright chilly for Monday. Maybe a shock to the system for some since we've been relatively mild here the past week. Saturday, our temperature around 46 degrees in the morning, up to about 60 by the middle of the afternoon, and we'll top off in those upper 60s for the day. A partly sunny to uh, mainly sunny sky expected for Saturday. I do see a little more cloud cover for Sunday, and that's going to be due to that secondary front coming in, which will bring us colder numbers by Monday. Mostly cloudy skies in the morning. Should give way to a little bit more sunshine in the afternoon. Temperatures, though, uh, will respond to the amount of cloud cover that we have around. Expecting highs in the upper 50s to low 60s for the day on Sunday. So a little cooler for St. Patrick's Day. And even colder as we head into early next week. That second front coming in will drop numbers early Monday morning in the low 30s as well as Tuesday. Tuesday, the first day of spring officially, and it is looking quite frosty area wide with temperatures expected to be below that freezing mark. Now, uh, it's not uh, anything unusual for this time of year. Our latest or I should say our average last freeze is the end of the month and the latest freeze that we've ever seen is April 25th. So still in the wheelhouse of seeing frosts and freezes. We'll give it another couple of weeks likely before we can at least start to question whether or not we are done with the uh, cold weather for the season. Future track here will continue to push this front south as we head into tomorrow. That keeps skies mainly sunny to partly cloudy skies uh, for the afternoon hours. That second front right here is going to bring in some colder weather. It is also going to keep this batch of showers and storms to our south early Sunday morning. I can't rule out a stray shower possible uh, toward the Tennessee and Alabama border, but the overall stronger thunderstorms look to stay well south of us in Alabama and then will dry out as we head into Sunday, Sunday night into Monday looking quiet, but yes, cold early Monday as those temperatures drop back into the low 30s. So we check out your seven day forecast here. We go from 68 tomorrow to 62 Sunday upper 40s for Monday and staying quite cold for early Tuesday morning. 56 to the high for the first day of spring and we're back to the mid to upper 60s as we head towards the end of the week. Notice something that's lacking any rain chance. Good chance of rain. Uh, stray showers for Sunday and Friday next week. Weather window presented by the National Weather Desk. At least three people are dead following a tornado outbreak in Ohio. Some of the worst damage is in Logan County, northwest of Columbus. The same system brought plenty of large and damaging hail to the Cincinnati area, leaving some cars with broken windshields. And shortly before the storm arc, an eagle-eyed viewer captured this impressive rotating wall cloud nearby. For more content like this, like the National Weather Desk on Facebook. You can see more weather stories like this every weekday morning on the National Weather Desk. It starts at 8 a.m. on our sister station, MyTV30. Russians cast their ballot in a wartime presidential election. With your new Nissan here at North Nashville's Nissan of Rivergate in Madison. This Fox 17 newscast is sponsored by the Nashville Preds. Continuing coverage tonight on a presidential contest where the winner is almost preordained. As Fox 17 News' Alex Hogan shows us, Russians are headed to the polls right now. A wartime election seen by the West mostly as a sham. 
Voters in Russia are heading to the polls, but who will win the country's eighth presidential election is something of a foregone conclusion. Longtime leader Vladimir Putin is widely expected to coast to another big victory, winning a fifth term as Russia's president after killing, jailing or exiling most of his opponents. Despite the anticipated Putin victory, reaction was largely mixed on the streets of Moscow. Some voters are strongly backing the president, while others say they're hoping for change. Life is very difficult now. We're coping for now, but I hope it will be a little better. What do I expect? That everything will be fine, that he will make our country better, and that we will move forward. Of course, this election is being carried out against the backdrop of the ongoing war in Ukraine. In parts of the countries occupied by Russia, tremendous pressure is being exerted on locals to head to the polls, part of a broader strategy to annex those regions both politically and culturally. We got direct threats like, if you don't get a Russian passport, you won't be able to go to the store, anywhere, complete isolation in your home. And Putin is accusing the Ukrainians of trying to sabotage the election in eastern Ukraine, issuing an ominous new threat to Kyiv. The regime is trying to carry out a number of criminal attacks with the aim of disrupting the voting process. These attacks will not go unpunished. The Kremlin also says that the U.S. is trying to interfere with the election. The White House calls those allegations categorically false. In London, Alex Hogan, Fox News. A new study looks at your sit time and a potential link to your heart health and how long you live. I'm Liz Bonus. What a difference it could make if we stand up. We explain just ahead. Pizza. Get $5 off our signature eight-corner pizza today. Jets, better because it has to be. In health news tonight, if you sit a lot at work, I'm thinking of me, uh, <laughs> you may want to consider taking a, a few breaks throughout the day that make you move. Okay, well, Fox 17 there medical reporter Liz Bonas shares a new study on what it takes to pass the sit test. This study takes a look at how long we sit and its impact on our health. We always knew it kind of made a difference in our heart health. Now we know how much. To find this out, researchers in JAMA Network Open reviewed the sitting habits of nearly 500,000 people. They found out what the president and CEO of the Center for Closing the Health Gap told me is true. Healthy lifestyle consists of, you know, some moderate physical activity. That's right, you simply can't stay as well as possible if you don't move. Sitting is the new smoking, right? And, and so, you know, the more that we are sedentary, um, you know, be it watching television or being on a device and not moving, um, that's affecting our healthy lifestyle. Researchers found people who have to sit most of the day at work have a 16% higher risk of mortality from all causes and a 34% higher risk of mortality from cardiovascular disease. This compared to those who don't sit around most of the day. It may be due to this actual lack of movement or maybe it's due to the other good habits that are lacking that people who tend to move also pick up such as yoga. Anything that causes calmness and I think people who get into yoga or any kind of health, physical fitness, they are going to walk more, exercise more, they're going to eat better, and I think they can improve their lifestyles. Making up for sit time may be as simple as... Sometimes just really understanding the simple things we can do to increase our physical activity that may not involve us joining a gym or being in a physical fitness class. Which means getting up from sitting and moving around all day can help but you need to get that total movement time up to 15 to 30 minutes a day. Now, one other note, there was a study recently which also showed even if you work out morning or evening, movement through the day makes a difference. So you can't get away with still just sitting all day. With your health news, I'm Liz Bondis reporting. All right, Katie, that's it. All that walking you do from the weather center to the wall, that's going to help you on some level. Yes, <laughs> get your steps in. That's good to know. Yeah, that's right. I'm keeping track. Uh, let's take a look at your forecast as we head into the weekend. Looking uh, pretty nice. Saturday, a high of 68 degrees. Yeah. Sunshine and uh, St. Patrick's Day on Sunday. Uh, we already have our zoo, zoo tickets for tomorrow. Oh, that'll We're be going fun. To the zoo what are Kids they doing out there? Some that. kind of a big yeah. St. Patrick's Day sort of no, just, just we just want to go to the zoo because it's a nice day. Push and we the have kids those around. passes. We're like, 